Now you're in for some good stories. I'm going to introduce the person who's responsible for the boat on the front. And Ken Ballou is a great storyteller. And I'm sure he's going to tell us some great stories about what it was like when he first came back. Ken? Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, the, uh, I wanted to say what an honor it is to be partnered up with the museum here and the people at the Presbyterian and, and the share a podium with uh, Mr. Brinkley. Um, he's a pro prolific writer and I wanted to take an opportunity to say that uh, Mr. Brinkley you've inspired me to embark on my own literary career and um, my book will be out this Christmas it's called The King of Uptown. Um, I was told by a PR person who never missed an opportunity for a cheap plug. So. <laughs> um, I also wanted to, uh, to further commend the people and the staff here at the State Museum in, in a different way than what Sam just did. Um, the staff here, uh, they started collecting artifacts of what they thought was a historic storm. And what they didn't know, a lot of them didn't know the status of their own homes, a lot of them didn't know the location of, of family members. And um, they continued to do that difficult work to secure this building and other buildings under the umbrella of the State Museum. And they, uh, what they also didn't know was that they weren't collecting artifacts of a historic storm, that they were collecting artifacts of our culture. So um, as a 10th generation New Orleanian and somebody who's been here all my life, I think I could speak for everybody when I, when I say thank you for all the work you guys have done. So. It's, uh, I was just telling somebody it's hard to speak about a subject in public when you're emotional about it. So uh, um, this is going to be a sad story, but it has a happy ending. So um, I wanted to clarify something that's been going on in the press this week. And uh, like Mr. Brinkley said, that as time goes on, we start to piece together more information in our mind of, of how things happen and what happened. And with me, I was, during the storm, I was living a double life. Um, during the day, I was doing the work on the boat, and a lot of you have heard that story. We were pulling people out of their houses and bringing them to dry land, and, um, and it was difficult. It was, it was hard work. It, was, um, uh, it took me years to realize that it was rewarding. But um, during that time, I would occasionally run into police officers, uh, members of the law enforcement community, and I was often met with hostility. And the reason for that, it took me years to figure out why there might have been hostility towards me. And it was this week that I started to figure that out. And um, along with the, the ones who were hostile towards me, there were also some that, op that um, opened their arms up to me and were more than helpful, um, more than, than gracious for my presence there. Um, I don't know if I was a threat that I was doing the job that some people were sworn to do. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, um, you know, there were officers who were wearing the Star and Crescent badge of the New Orleans Police Department that, that helped me greatly. So um, I'm thankful for them. Um, I'm also thankful that my alter ego at night, I turned into a common criminal. I was, I was breaking into many of your homes. I was, these boats run on gas. And one thing we didn't have was gasoline. So I was going into your houses looking for gas. I was, I was going into sheds and garages of, of every neighbor, of anybody I, that I knew, and, and mostly people that I didn't know. And um, I was a looter. And to hear, <clears throat> to hear this week that, <clears throat> that they were given an order to shoot looters, uh, that hit home. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I told you I'm gonna try to not get emotional, but um, I'm thankful that there were commanders within the New Orleans Police Department that disobeyed orders. I'm thankful that there were people that, um, that wear that Star and Crescent badge that, that had a conscience that they are New Orleanians first and they were protecting us. So they showed up for their jobs, some of them didn't, some of them were doing bad things while they were wearing that badge, but the ones that I ran across, uh, they saved my life. So I'm, I'm thankful for that. Um, that's not the story I wanted to tell you. So <laughs> I apologize about that there. But uh, uh, during the storm, 
um, several days after these events with the NOPD were happening, uh, the military finally rolled in. And there was a commander of the military, a young guy, he was a, he was a colonel. Um, he was in charge of 500 soldiers and um, a couple of hundred MPs. He was about my age and he was very media savvy. And when he was done with the media um, and done um, marshalling his troops around, he usually told the media, if you want to see something bad, you want to see the gore and death, go with that guy in the boat. So every day when I got my new allotment of, um, of soldiers, um, I also had a couple of members of the press that came with me. And of course I would bring them, they would ask me, you know, what's the, what's the worst thing you could show me? And I brought them to Baptist Hospital, and we all know, you know, what that looked like and what that, you know, must have been like in there. And I let them look around in there. And our area of operation went from the far reaches of Tulane University to all the way up St. Charles Avenue to the interstate, and from the river to as far north as we can get in the boat. And the water started at St. Charles Avenue and went north. So, um, so within that area of operation just branching out, our, our boats were usually parked somewhere on Napoleon Avenue. Branching out from there, um, we had several dozen uh, deceased citizens in New Orleans in the streets. And as we've become fairly numb as Americans, as New Orleanians, to seeing the, the, um, the daily facts of young African American men um, who have been killed every day, um, I could tell you that being on the streets and seeing the, the same person who is deceased day after day um, and there's not a, uh, a police barricade or a, a CSI unit around them, that, that it's, it's more than numbing. Um, and as time went on, uh, I started to realize that these people, and this might sound a little um, morbid, but these people were the ones that I had something in common with. They were they were New Orleanians. They were like me. They were they were here, and um, it because it, it, everyone on the boat with me was uh, was from somewhere else. Um, by about the eighth or ninth day, there was there was nobody from New Orleans left here, and, and um, it was a, a, a bit strange to to keep seeing this day after day. But what I didn't show the press, what I would go out of my way to restrict the press from seeing was behind Baptist Hospital, um, behind the hospital there, there was a, a fenced in area. It was a parking lot and in there were two more bodies. And these people, they were, um, I, I hate to use the word intimate, but they were a couple of people that I became greatly intimate with. Um, it was a man and a woman, and they were, like, they were like me. They were like any of you. They had jobs. They um, were about my age, and they were dead. And um, every day after I parked the Skeeter and whatever boats we had, I, I would stuff the Skeeter behind a house and uh, paddle out of there in a, uh, in a pirog. I would go into this parking lot and, and spend a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, I want to know more about them, and I didn't feel like it was dignified to bring the press by there and have their video taken and flashed on some TV station where we would never see the video. So um, I continued uh, visiting with them and, and drawing conclusions, and um, I drew conclusions that um, they were more like me and anyone else in this room than than any differences we might have had. They were, they were workers. They were wearing hospital scrubs and not in the sense that they were patients at the hospital. They were wearing scrubs in the sense that they worked there. They had um, nurses shoes on and blue hospital scrubs. And one day after we had several boats that were still running at the end of the day, I needed help parking them. So I had a soldier with me and we I was debating on bringing him in there because it was, it was a little um, gruesome. And, but I, I continued on and we paddled in there and he knew exactly what we were doing and I told him we were, we were going to pay someone a visit. 
And uh, we sat there silently, and he said, um, maybe we should check them for identification. And when you're sitting in a P-ROG and trying to manipulate a body that's been in the water for two weeks, it's, it's um, something that neither of us were mentally or physically prepared to do. Um, we weren't successful in finding any, any identification, but the following day I went back there alone and I did find something. Um, on her wrist was a, um, a bracelet with a Florida Lee. And that told me she was a Saints fan. <laughs> so, told me she had faith and she had hope for 37 years up to that point that she was a Saints fan, that she was a hard worker, that she went to work to try to make a better life for herself, try to make a better life for her family. And there were people in the city that didn't do that. It told me that in the middle of a storm, she disregarded the safety of, her, of, of herself and, and her, her family and went to work. And that was exactly what a lot of us did. We did something dangerous in the storm. And for her, it cost her her life. So since the storm, I've, like I said, I've been writing. And, and I think about her and a coworker there a lot. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, we went through a Katrina funk. We went through that depression that we had for years after Katrina. That, you know, we couldn't get a, a, a decent meal in town um, at a decent hour. And everything closed at six. Everybody was on Katrina hours and, and uh, Katrina staff and the streets were in disrepair. City Hall was completely dysfunctional. The police department was completely unmotivated and ineffectual. And it, it was a badge of embarrassment. And I, I didn't want to talk about it. But now I think that maybe if, if that's what you're feeling, that was certainly what I was feeling, that maybe we should, we should reclassify that as a badge of honor, that we survived Katrina, and despite what we lost, despite that we lost those two citizens, those two hard workers in the middle of the storm, that we have a lot to live for. And we would do them a disservice if we didn't continue on this path of success, if we didn't have the hope and the faith that she had for 37 years, that, that things will get better. And if we can go back and whisper her in her ear the day before she went to work that day, which was five years to this day, and tell her that in five years, your saints are going to be champions. <laughs> um, we're going to have a new city hall. We're going to have a new, a new attitude. We're going to have new streets, a school system that's on its way to, to being respected, a police department that's on its way to being changed and effect, effective, that you have to believe, you have to have faith, you have to have hope that she would be happy for us. So I think that's the happy ending to this story. So thank you.